Legend Rares, the rarest gacha units in the game. There aren't any guaranteed draws for them, and they generally have a much lower drop rate than Ubers. It takes some hard grinding, or just some good luck to get them. And well, if we're being honest, they are kind of just glorified Ubers. But that doesn't stop them from being incredibly cool units, and today, we're gonna take a look at all of them individually and in depth. Generally, Legend Rares are conceptually exactly like the Ubers, but with a few differences. The upgrade cap for Legend Rares is raised from 20 to 25 at 1110 user rank, and from 25 to 30 at 1410 user rank, 10 more each than when the Uber cap is raised. While the XP costs for upgrading Ubers and Legend Rares are the same, Legend Rares can't be upgraded to level 60 with Dark Cat Size, and also require Legend Cat Size to be boosted above 30. The Proving Ground's final level leads to a total of 5 stages, each with a 5.88% chance to drop 2 Legend Cat Size, while every other type of Cat Size drops at a 23.53% chance. It's not very common, but you should be farming the Proving Grounds anyways, so it is a nice bonus. Double Advent Boss Missions also give 3 each on completion, and will be available whenever Ponus feels like making them appear. How reliable. Legend Quest is also a pretty good source of them, dropping 8 in total after you clear all 48 stages, but again, only appears when Ponos wants it to. Infernal Tower has randomized drops, and 12 of the stages in it as of now where it has 40, can drop cat size in groups of 3, with legend eyes at a 20% chance equal to all other types of eyes. This is actually pretty good, and most of the time, if you were to clear these 12 stages, you would get some Legend Cat Size from doing so. You can also get one Legend Cat Size from every second stage in each Empress research map, for a total of 5. These 5 Cat Size are pretty much your guaranteed 5 Legend Cat Size if you want to upgrade Legend Rares in the mid game. But as well as other methods shown, you can get more. You can also get Legend Cat Size from User Rank but the rewards start past the 15,000 user rank mark, so this is not really a viable option for most. And finally, while Cat Shrine can drop Legend Cat Size, the efficiency rate is so awful that you shouldn't ever try to get them this way. Shown by the fact that these are your methods to obtain Legend Cat Size, boosting Legend Rares past 30 in the mid game can be pretty challenging at times. As you make more progress throughout the game though, you'll have plenty of Legend Cat Size to upgrade your Legend Rares in Endgame. These Legend Rares are all pretty good units in my opinion, with almost all of them worth boosting to some degree, since they all benefit from increased stats around the board. If you have better options, or no Legend Rare at all, you could use these Legend Cat Size to instead substitute normal Cat Size, but personally, I like to keep some spare just in case. Usually, most Legend Rares tend to be specialists, focused on destroying a certain trait, but there are some who end up being generalists. One thing that is pretty consistent theming-wise is how all Legend Rares utilize some white crystal as part of their design, with exception to some collab Legend Rares. All Legend Rares, however, do have a unique white crystal death animation. Now isn't that pretty cool? Now that the basics are out of the way, Let's get into each Legend Rare in depth. If you want to look at a particular Legend Rare, timestamps are in the description. I'll go in the unit release order for non-collab units first, and then do the collab Legend Rares afterwards. The first Legend Rare by unit release order, who was also released in the same update as the next two, is Musashi Miyamoto, from Sengoku War Gods Vegiras. Second form, War God Miyamoto. He looks like a pretty legendary swordsman, I would say. Stats are shown here. He's an anti-black specialist, with insane damage and resist versus blacks, and has pretty high HP and dragon tier range. His single target tends to not make him the best option on black enemy spam stages, but he can be more useful occasionally versus single black threats. In the pure land in its restriction stage, he can basically solo Okame even at just level 30 with proper setup and combos. That's pretty good, 
but a lot of his other anti-black usages aren't that special due to already existing strong options versus black, such as pizza, bomber, or box. Although weak to spam, that's where you can use your other attackers to complement him on the field. As a generalist, Miyamoto acts as a heavy type dragon unit, with the 400 range and single target. He has great damage and HP, and his cooldown is actually shorter than most units, at around 1.5 minutes. He can work very well in early and mid game as supplementary damage, especially when dragon tier units tend to be under leveled at that time. Your normal dragon might be low from lack of plus levels, and your crazed dragon might be capped at 20, so Musashi can pick up the slack quite well. Against certain enemies, he's great against Lenore, as he can easily tank it and return heavy amounts of damage. Similarly, he can tank Toucan's waves and juggle or kill them pretty fast. Dark Auda, who tends to appear in small numbers, can be dealt with very well by Musashi as well. For non-black enemies, he's good at doing what dragons can do, works as a good DPS option versus Arost, Emost, and Aichna, as well as Ursa Major, Chick-fil-A, Slepner, and I Am Face when they're easily reachable. Curse on piercing or high range backliners tends to give Miyamoto a hard time. This can include enemies such as Loris, Othom, and Loki, but with proper support Miyamoto can still work there. He also isn't too good versus very swarmy stages, especially when mixed with non-black enemies. Some notable stages where Miyamoto can shine include the aforementioned The Pure Land, where he essentially gives you a free win, 8k Fertilizer, where he outranges Arost, easily takes down Dark Autas, and can live hits from Kurosawa, and No Hope Ranch, where he can outrange and deal damage to Emost, and can do large chunks of damage to Lenore. Overall, while he isn't game-breaking, War God Miyamoto is still a nice tool to have in your arsenal, and is a pretty good helper in earlier parts of the game. Though, a lot of the time in late or end game, black enemies tend to be paired with relics, and Miyamoto's lack of curse immunity can make him a bit tougher to use. He'll fall off later into the game you go, but if you get him early, he's definitely worth your time. Also in the same update as Miyamoto, we have Headmistress Jane from Cyber Academy Galaxy Gals. Second form, Headmistress Jane with a Greek letter. I'm pretty sure it's Psy. You know, I like how her second form description is suggesting something. But anyways, stats are shown here. She has insane damage versus red and floating, and a long distance attack. She's also pretty fast, which makes her pretty good at dodging LD enemies and rushing stages. As an anti-floating, Jane is excellent at dealing with them. The fast attack rate and LD allows her to quickly remove floating peons from the field, as well as juggle the slightly tankier ones. She also outranges a lot of floating enemies with her 400 range and can safely hit even more with her LD. As for anti-red, she works pretty well against them too, can potentially snipe Professor A, although it is pretty tricky to set up. For similar reasons, fighting versus red energy requires setting her up for LD. She generally counters all the red enemies that Courier also happens to counter, which both shows how good she is at killing red enemies, and how Courier kinda just destroys all red enemies. As a generalist, her DPS isn't too high. It's a bit higher than Afro, for example, but with a lot less range. She can be decent supplementary LD damage for when you need some extra piercing damage. This tends to be most relevant when you're still in the mid game. When it comes to enemies, she pretty much deletes any floating in the game that isn't a super backliner or Othom, and works well into most reds. For wave enemies like Pigeon and Toucan, if you support her with a wave blocker, she can counter them pretty well. She's also a great counter to Gobble in most stages, and usually ends up juggling him. Just like Miyamoto, Curse can be pretty bad for Jane, as it removes her insane damage multiplier, which is where most of her DPS comes from. She also isn't that tanky, so piercing LDs and surges can be problematic for her, as well as zombies that burrow and enter her blind spot. Some good stages for her include generally floating and red heavy stages such as Boiling Spring. She can also help you beat Protein Cartel with the right setup. 
Gobble stages in general, like Poison on Rice or Cloak of Hiding are also places where she can end up shining. Overall, a very competent anti-red and floating specialist, Headmistress Jane will be a pretty good addition to your arsenal. The last of the three initial legend rares is High Lord Babel from Lords of Destruction Dragon Emperors. Second form, Babel the Dark Flame. In true form, God Emperor Babel. If you like castles or dragons, it looks like Ponus' response was why not both. Stats are shown here. Babel is a ranged tanker with a lot of HP and immunities, but his high cost, mediocre speed, and long attack animation make him hard to use. There's also the problem of his niche just generally being replaceable by Row vs. Red and Octo vs. Floating. Babel can work as a decent tanker option in the early game, especially if you don't have Row or Octo yet, but is really not worth using once you get those two respectively. The Colossus Slayer given to him in true form is pretty much catered towards only one stage, on Mighty Wings where he actually can be pretty good, having an insane resist versus a lot of enemies in that stage. After getting more immunities in true form, you might think that he'd be better as a generalist tanker, but his lackluster stats in every department except HP leaves this as not very good. His toxic immunity in particular can be useful at times, but he isn't going to do well if the stage has mixed enemies that aren't just reds or floatings. Against specific enemies, his true form is a very solid wall against Gobble. While he can tank frontline Gobble pretty well, his damage is pretty unreliable in most situations, so you will want to support him with other damagers. His high HP and insane resist also allows him to sponge off Brawlo and Zalo hits very well, and he can also take Pigeon hits, albeit doesn't wave block them like Octo would. Mixed enemies are pretty much the bane of Babel's existence, and can quickly drain his tanker HP, even for as high as it is. Curse also cripples him and removes the insane resist modifier, which is pretty detrimental to him. Enemy spam stages can cause him to miss, and he might not work too well on low cash stages due to his high cost. Some stages where he actually works well on include the aforementioned Mega Muth Gauntlet, where he can actually tank the backline very well. Has insane resist versus Professor A, Mega Move, all the Brawlos and Pigeons, while the zombie enemies are going to burrow underneath him and you can fight them individually. Protein Cartel in 1 to 3 stars is hard countered by his true form, as he can tank gobble hits for days. Similarly, Bathtub of Whimsy seems him tanking quite a lot of Brawlo hits, and using his high damage per hit to one-shot them which prevents extra rebound damage. Dark Lord's Decree follows the same principle, tanking as many Zalo and Gobble hits as he wants. While this might look appealing, these stages aren't actually too bad to play normally with the right units, and his overall lackluster stats and niche make him pretty undesirable to use most of the time. Also, in order to utilize his toxic immunity, you need his true form, and investing a handful of stones into a subpar unit might not be too high on your priority list. He's quite the pocket pick in late or end game, and works as a decent tanker in the early game. Realistically, while Babel is not as good as most other legend rares, he can be nice on that rare occasion. Coming up next, we have Ushiwakamaru from Ancient Heroes Ultra Souls. Second form, Colossal Benkai. Just like Pai Pai, it looks like he's got the Banhammer. These forms have very different stats and mechanics, so I'll start with the first form. Stats for Ushi Makamaru are shown here. Ushi is a pretty good spammable anti-angel, with both solid damage and HP against angels. You can use him as a very effective mid-ranger against them, sort of like using Kasa Jizo, and can also use him to rush down Slepnirs. Technically, you could use Ushi as a generalist mid-ranger, sort of like Cameraman, but due to his 250 range and 2 KBs, there tend to be better options instead of him. Moving on to Colossal Benkei, stats are shown here. Benkei pretty much can be used against any angel enemy and will absolutely destroy them. His DPS and HP are also quite high for a 450 range uber, making him a decent generalist. He does cost quite a bit though, and has a long cooldown. For specific enemies, 
he pretty much beats all of the angels. Just make sure to use his second form if you're fighting Winged Piggy, as his first form will get weakened and will not perform too well. I'd also generally recommend running Benkei over Ushi versus Slepners and Chick fil A's as well. These enemies tend to be backliners, and you want a high range attacker instead of a short one to reach them. First form can be more useful if you are dealing with low range angel enemies like Gabriel's Hippos and Angelic Gories. The counters for Ushi differ between forms, but both can be crippled very hard by Curse. Of course, while a lot of angel stages have cursing enemies, you can still use Ushi to beat them if you play well. Besides Curse, Ushi's first form can generally have trouble against enemies with mixed enemies above 250 range, and generally against hard pushing enemies. Benkei works a bit better versus mixed enemies due to being a bit more sturdy, but can still have trouble with LD attacks or surges. He also costs quite a bit. But if you need an anti-angel in a cash tight stage, you can simply switch back to his first form. Stages where you can see Ushi perform well on include angel heavy stages like Rutsborg Vortex, Heron's Call, and Bear Fangs at the Throne. Now, while all of these do have a relic enemy, Benkai's incredible damage output basically means that even just a few uncursed shots can change the tide of the battle. He can also absolutely destroy No Plan A as well as New Testament in A Cat Screaming Love. Generally, all of the scary angel stages get shut down hard by Benkei. Ushiwakamaru and Colossal Benkei combine together to be one of the best anti-angel options in the game. Once you get Ushi, angel heavy stages should be much easier than they were before. I'd say that Ushi is one of the best legend rares right now because what he does is simple and very effective. He's built to demolish all angels in the game, and that's exactly what he does. Wonder Momoko is the legend rare from the Dynamites. Second form, Cutie Momoko. Well, isn't she just everyone's favorite unit to watch dance to Gamatoto music for an hour? Stats are shown here. She's a pretty solid crowd control and damage option versus reds, blacks, and angels. The first hit of her attack does a guaranteed level 8 wave which has a 1732.5 range, and has a 2 second freeze versus her target traits. After that, she does a bit more damage in a second hit, and then a pretty large amount in the third hit. Her freeze can be very useful at freezing backliners due to the wave reach, as well as occasional support peons due to the wave's lasting hitbox catching them even if the enemies are initially in knockback state. Her KB count is only 2 though, so she can end up dying pretty easily if not protected well. Her long attack animation can also lead to her missing her nuke hit if the enemies you are against have high KB counts, so watch out for that. As a generalist, she's pretty solid. Her 9000 DPS is really good for a backliner, albeit one with short range. You can get good usage out of her as an anti-wave DPS option, or just a DPS option in certain stages. Given how a lot of stages have at least one red, black, or angel enemy as a supporting peon or threat, she can end up freezing them as well for extra value. Some enemies in particular she can be good versus are Winged Piggy and Angelic Slepner, as the guaranteed freeze wave is very good at freezing them when they are traditionally hard to freeze. The long wave can also reach and stun Kurosawa, Kalamaria, and Sunfish Jones, making her a good support option if those are the main backliners. As do other wave attackers, she beats most wave enemies. Momoko can be crippled pretty hard by Curse, as pretty much every other specialist without Curse immunity can be, especially enemies with piercing Curse hits or just long range. As for non-cursers, as for non-cursers, lasting surges can do big damage to her due to not getting knocked back very easily, and hard pushing stages can generally eat up her two knockbacks very fast if they have non-angel, black, or red enemies as pushers. Now, you might think that the knockback ability would counter her and prevent her from landing her nuke damage hit, but because her TBA is zero, what actually happens is that her attack gets fully reset and she does the freeze wave again. So in this case, it leads to her trading her damage output for more CC than usual, which can be a positive or negative depending on the situation, usually a positive though. 
as for stages, she's pretty good at the ones that tend to be mixed between red, black, and angel enemies. These can include Spa of Ascension, Palacio Waters, and Leadfoot Drive. On certain St. Dober stages like Guild of Masks and Canopy Altar, she can help free St. Dober and reach the backliner as well. Funnily enough, her massive wave range is able to reach and freeze even Raynard, so that's pretty cool. Some gauntlet bosses like Baron Seal and Exiel are also great for her. Overall, Momoko is a great unit to use both for CC and damage when on the right stages for her. Her consistency in the guaranteed freeze wave makes a lot of crowd control stages run a lot smoother. And personally, I'd say she's one of the more fun units the game has to offer. From the Tales of Nekaluga banner, we have Legaluga. Second form, Legoland Passlan. His appearance is based off Killer Queen from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, but unfortunately, Legaluga can't turn enemies into bombs, summon indestructible seeking bombs, or go back in time. What a disappointment. Stats are shown here. He's got pretty solid rusher stats all around the board, with a noticeably high range. However, he has one very important stat he is lacking in, and that is his cooldown. Signature of the Lugas to have long cooldown, his is 124 seconds, which might not be too long for a backliner, but definitely is long for a rusher type unit. For reference, this is more than double Yukimura's cooldown. Spawning like Luga at the wrong moment can be detrimental to you, as you won't get him back for a while. You definitely have to put in care in order to get value from him, but it can be hard to keep him alive with only 300 range and a fast 20 speed. The lack of a specialization with a target trait also prevents him from being used for anything besides generalist usage. About that generalist usage though, he's a pretty solid support DPS option and rusher at times, albeit what he can rush or be support DPS for is pretty restrictive. You'd want him to rush enemies that he has a range advantage versus, or are LDs so he doesn't get hit by them. While his DPS is pretty good, there's plenty of high DPS midranger units that can counter what he does with both a faster cooldown and better cost efficiency. He is wave immune, but we also have Dancer to just do most things he does. Some enemies he can be good on are ones that have lower range than him and can be juggled. This includes the Gori family, Seal family, and Kangaroo family. He does outrange our Osts, so he can be used versus him in the early game for some additional support damage. His immunities make him good against rushing down some annoying status enemies, such as Calamari, which he can do so without fear of being weakened. A lot of enemies also counter Legaluga, and those are the ones which have a range advantage versus him, or have piercing attacks with no blind spawn. He also isn't surge immune, so those can be problematic for him. When it comes to thinking of stages, there aren't really any in specific where Legaluga shines very much, as he is a pure generalist. His immunities make him pretty good at rushing snitches get stitches, but that stage is pretty easy anyways. He can be used in choir battle as a consistent rush answer to Calamari though, which is pretty useful. Overall, while not the most desirable unit, I'd still call Legaluga a viable unit. He's not gonna carry anything, but sometimes additional damage and rusher value is pretty nice to have, especially when in early game or mid game. Mighty Crystal Moo comes from the Frontline Assault Iron Legion set. Second form, Doom Engine Pandora, also known as the 3D Printer. One thing I've always liked about Iron Legion is how the designs are massive machines with whole crews, and Moo is no different. However, the Fat Rice Cat is not here yet, so let's hope for that in true form. Stats are shown here. Mu is a great anti-zombie option with great stats, resist, and insane damage versus zombies. His one knockback ensures that he'll never have his attack interrupted, though it makes sure he also never repositions. His one speed keeps him near your side of the map, allowing him to catch and eliminate burrowing zombies but at the same time makes him hard to use at the front line. Wave Blocker is a pretty interesting addition as well. His 400 range makes sure he's a ranged Wave Blocker, which can be useful, 
but if your units push forwards, his one speed makes it so that your units might get hit by the wave if he is stuck behind. But even with those flaws, being a ranged wave blocker is very useful at times. As a generalist, he is very awkward to use, due to his KB count of 1 and speed of 1. Long cooldown, as with most Iron Legions, makes him pretty hard to get back. I don't think you'd ever want to use him on general usage besides wave stages, but if you happen to use him on zombie stages with mixed enemies, he can still do decent amounts of damage to the non-zombie enemies. When it comes to enemies, he pretty much counters the entire zombie race. However, his low speed makes him not the greatest Zamel counter, as it takes ages for Mu to reach Zamel. Wave enemies in general also get blocked pretty well by Pandora. As for counters, these tend to be in the form of status effects. Curse can remove his multipliers versus zombies, which will heavily cripple him, and just the usual freeze, knockback, and warp can be pretty annoying for him. As for slow, he's already at one speed, so you won't really notice a difference. Knockback and warp can be particularly detrimental while using him as a wave blocker, as it will cause the waves to not be blocked. Stages he can demolish include zombie heavy stages, like unauthorized breathing, internal scream, and the top floor of Zombie Citadel. He works great versus medium zombie support enemies, so he can defend your base well in Floor 43, Adventurer's Journal, Hell's Crater, and Speechless Tongues. While it might not look like so, he actually performs well in Retreat of the Living Dead, because Gollum Sunfish is a weird enemy that only curses units in the first hit, which has no forward pierce in of itself, meaning that Mu's slow speed prevents him from ever walking into it and getting cursed. Yeah. He can also be great on Manic Jamira, preventing waves and outranging the boss. All in all, Mu is a fantastic answer to zombies and a nice wave blocker to have at times. In a way, he kind of is to zombies what Ushi is to angels. They both are incredibly good at destroying their respective trait. Next up is Lumina from Nature's Guardian's Elemental Pixies. Second form, Luminalia. As you might know, the Pixies are kind of based on Pokemon types, so I'll be the guy to say that Luminalia would be pretty fitting as a normal fairy type mythical. Her first form, while different from the second, is essentially outclassed by her second form in almost every situation, so I won't be showcasing it. Stats for the second form are shown here. She's a very good alien tanker, with almost a million effective HP at level 30, which she can increase even more with the addition of her guaranteed weaken. She'll carry you through Cats of the Cosmos very easily, and will also help on other alien-based stages. As a generalist, her cooldown and price make her a decent rusher that can also work as a mid-ranger. Her DPS is decent, and when combined with her large range, she can actually outrange a lot of enemies that she's meant to rush and stay alive for a very long time. You can also use her as a standard range damage support due to her 375 range. She's pretty much great at walling most regular alien enemies, and she has a ridiculous HP pool versus them. Whether they are starred aliens or regular aliens, she'll do the job just fine. Her guaranteed barrier breaker also allows her to consistently counter them. As for what she can struggle with, Curse is pretty effective at crippling her versus aliens. Knockback can also push her back and let enemies progress. Non-alien enemy backliners tend to be able to do a lot of damage to her as well, as her fast speed lets her push into their range. Despite all of these potential soft counters, her good generalist stats can still make it worth using her in these cases. Lots of alien stages are quite easily shut down by Luminalia. Puffer Planet, Razor Torches, Chapel Transfer, and lots of Cats of the Cosmos stages. In Speechless Tongues, she works amazingly, can essentially tank the entire backline as you focus on dealing with Sang Rus. In Banana Genomes, she can take as many Yukan waves as she wants, and outranges Slepnir. Although she can clip inside of his range, this doesn't tend to happen as her high range allows the swarm of Yukans to move forward and keep her still. 
Lumina is a pretty simple unit to use and a pretty strong one as well. Very effective alien tanker, and performs well in general usage as well. If you get her early, Cats of the Cosmos should be pretty smooth sailing. The legend rare from the Dark Heroes banner is Dr. Heaven. Second form, Professor Abyss. Not gonna lie, her design kind of gives me the same vibes as Bondrood from Maiden Abyss. Wait a second, I think that actually might be a reference. Stats are shown here. Do note that the stats for the first and second form are exactly the same, with the only change being the ability. In the first form, it's insane resist versus blacks and aliens, and in the second form, it's insane damage versus blacks and aliens. A big thing she's missing in the first form is a warp blocker, and this means she can be warped by star aliens, decreasing her effectiveness. In a similar vein, while black enemies usually not tend to be worth trying to tank, her 400 range and just insane resist ability in general makes it pretty good at shrugging off lots of hits from black enemies. In a lot of cases, it tends to be better to just kill these threats quickly instead of tanking them, and that's where her second form comes in. Her damage output versus black and alien enemies is pretty insane, and she can usually end up one-shotting medium-sized threats. One thing to note is that her base HP is actually very high, so her second form can still absorb quite a bit of damage if needed. She isn't as good as a generalist, with about average DPS but only 400 range. Although her HP is nice, a long cooldown of 168 seconds makes it hard to get back on the field. Though, if you are in need of bulky generalist DPS, she can take that role very well due to her incredible base HP. All medium-sized alien and black enemies are very good choices to use Abyss on, as she can usually one-shot them. Her 400 range is enough to safely shoot down Ursa Major and Moth, and while she doesn't outrange Lenore, she can still do big chunks of damage to him and live for a while due to her high base HP. Abyss has pretty good base stats that make her hard to counter, but a notable one for almost all Legend Rares is Curse, which removes her high damage modifier. The same can be said for Dr. Heaven, but her tanker form is also countered pretty well by the warp ability. Most other things don't end up countering Abyss, however, as she's a pretty well-rounded unit. Abyss can be used very well to remove troublesome aliens and black enemies from the field on lots of stages. In Glass Slippers, she can annihilate the Ursa Majors, and even if she gets warped, she would have done enough damage to make a difference. Puffer Planet, Floor 47, Sticky Shower, and Tidy Kitchen all see her do big damage to her target trait. In Cosmic Juggernaut, her first form can be pretty helpful as well, as it tanks both the boss and Tacky easily. Dr. Heaven and Professor Abyss pretty much solve most of your black and alien problems. These two traits will become a whole lot easier the moment you get her, no matter what part of the game you are on. Straight from the strongest non-fest uber banner in the game, the Almighty's the Majestic Zeus, which has more than Zeus by the way, comes Gaia the Creator. Second form, Gaia the Supreme. In the spirit of all other Almighties, the design is incredibly over the top, especially for this tiny rabbit. Stats are shown here. Gaia is pretty much capable of destroying any traded non-metal enemy that isn't a super backliner. Some of the highest DPS in the game versus traded, and when you combine that with the fact that she's a 400 range backliner with LD up to 550, she can do some pretty ridiculous feats. Of course, this comes at with a lot of costs. Her inner range is only 50, so it's pretty easy for enemies to enter it if not supported properly. Also. Her KB count of 2 makes it that if enemies happen to reach her, she can only reposition once before dying. Her attack is also split into 3 multi-hits, which means she can miss out part of her damage sometimes, but at other times can actually juggle enemies between her multi-hits. All in all, this makes Gaia a very volatile unit. She can absolutely shred traded enemies, but at the cost of being very susceptible to being shredded by them as well. With this in mind, supporting Gaia well is key to her success, and she becomes a whole lot stronger once you unlock Rock, 
as that unit allows you to create temporary impenetrable shields to protect her with. Another thing to note is that her HP is actually quite high. Here's a funny interaction. At level 40, Gaia can just straight up walk to a 200% Professor A and shoot him in the face. Because Gaia is a pure generalist, she can easily delete most enemies she can touch in the game. In particular, she's great for some semi-backliner enemies that she can't outrange or hit safely with LD, such as Ursa Major, Slepner, Chick-fil-A, Moth, I Am Face, and surprisingly enough, Emost. With proper setup, she can also be effective versus Professor A. She can also deal with shorter range enemies, but you will need to watch out for them entering her blind spot. Gaia has a lot of counters, but a lot can be minimized. Curse is basically able to shut down her incredible damage output, so try to avoid getting her cursed with good support and timing. Zombies can also counter her very well. She doesn't have Z-Killer, and zombies can burrow into her blind spot and easily take her away with her small KB count. Surges are also very deadly to her due to her low KB count, as they can land multiple ticks and do a lot of damage to her. Generally, extremely hard pushing enemies can also make their way into her blind spot, but as always, with the right support, this can be solved with your other units. Gaia can earn value on quite a lot of stages. While most generalists can't completely screw over a stage, Gaia essentially has specialist tiers of DPS against all traits. Basic DPS test stages like Technocracy, Heron's Call, Adventurer's Journal, and Fire Kingdom Dynamite can see her output massive amounts of damage. While in other stages, she can just work as a great backliner. Overall, a very strong unit versus traded enemies, albeit one who requires a bit of planning to utilize well. Gaia is a very powerful unit, a very volatile unit, and in my opinion, a very fun unit as well. Personally, she's my favorite legend rare, as I just quite enjoy squeezing as much value as possible out of units, and Gaia is one that can net quite a lot. Next up, we have Kyosaka Nanaho from the Girls and Monsters Angels of Terror banner. Second form, true Kyosaka Nanaho. Nanaho is originally from Kyoto Project, another one of Ponus' games that has unfortunately been removed from the App Store. The banner itself uses girls from the game Girls Mons, which is yet another Ponus game that is already gone. Technically, she is a collab unit since she doesn't originate from Battle Cats, but just like the banner, since Ponos owns these franchises, it can be scheduled to appear at any time Ponos wants it to. Stats are shown here. She's a very good answer to metal enemies. I'd personally call her the best crit uber or legendary in the game. Pretty good crit damage and chance, along with amazing survivability, makes her a very good option at dealing with metal enemies at any time. Her other primary usage is as a generalist. She has pretty good DPS for an LD unit, and can deal with enemy backliners very well. Her 7 knockbacks and survive lethal make her stand out as a very safe option compared to other generalists. Good speed, cost, and cooldown are also positives she has. She destroys all metal enemies for sure, but with her two other abilities, she can break long-ranged barriers such as those on the Solar and Ribbo and her Z-Killer allows her to be a good option to snipe and remove Zamel from the field. Other backliners like any Kamel, Master A, or Sloth variant can also be dealt with by her. As for counters, she has almost none. Curse will remove her insane resist against metals, but she still keeps her crits and can still demolish them. Zombies can burrow into her blind spot and reach her, but her 7 knockbacks and survive lethal makes it not the end of the world for her. The only real counters to Nanaho are Surges, as they are pretty good at hurting anything without Surge immunity. She can be pushed back on hard pushing stages, but usually gets value by snapping the backliner anyways. Metal stages like Bionic Seaweed, March to Death, Total Myopia, and Cloak of Feasting can easily be taken down by Nanaho. Other than metal stages, she'll work as a good generalist, but won't really hard carry too much. Overall, an incredibly well-rounded unit that provides value in almost any scenario. Effective at dealing with metal sages and a pretty solid generalist as well. 
a lot of people refer to her as one of the best Legendaries, and I can see why. She's constructed in a way that makes her incredibly easy to use, and pretty hard to lose any value with her. The final non-collab Legend Rare, and the last one to be released in the game so far is Emperor Cat from Dynasty Fest. Second form, Tyrant Cat. Tyrant is basically a reskin of the advent enemy Evil Emperor Cat. Unfortunately, he's kind of just the boss when you unlock him as a playable unit, and is obviously much weaker than the advent. Stats are shown here. He's quite the interesting unit, sporting the main four types of CC, each at a 30% chance. He's actually pretty reliable at inflicting at least some sort of status effect on traded enemies, so he's a very good crutch in early game. With 551 range, his range can counter problematic enemies like Master A variants, and his DPS is actually pretty good for his range. There are two main problems for Tyrant. The first is that his cooldown is pretty long, 161 seconds. The second and more important one is simply that his abilities are pure RNG. While he can do many types of status effects, you aren't in control of which ones he will do and when. This inherently makes him extremely unreliable as a unit, and one that doesn't see much usage outside of early to mid game once you get stronger and more reliable options. His lack of an LD or piercing ability also makes it hard to land consistent hits at times, unless the enemies are pushing you pretty hard. Yeah, if any Legend Rare in particular tends to fall off as the game progresses, it would have to be this guy. Generally, Tyrant's main use is as a backliner to hit long range enemies, or as crowd control if you don't have better options. The Boyne variants, Sloth variants, Master A variants, and other enemies around that range are good targets for Tyrant. He can technically outrange Kamel variants, but does by one range, so it can be inconsistent to get him to outrange them. Do know that if Tyrant outranges the main backliner in the stage, he can't really get you punished for doing the knockback ability, as he would push the entire side of enemies back. As for counters, Curse nullifies him from doing any of his crowd control effects, and LD enemies can be problematic to him due to his high standing range. His long force swing also leaves him vulnerable to hard pushing enemies. Due to his generalist nature, there are not really any stages in particular that he performs on extremely well. One that I can think of is Protein Cartel, as he can outrange the Gobble Swarm's Omni Strike toxic attacks and use his various status effects to keep them at bay. Overall, Tyrant is a decent backliner and support crowd control option for progression but doesn't tend to scale well into the latter part of the game as you go, as his value decreases and weaknesses become more prominent. Our first full-fledged collab legend rare is Black Zeus from the Bikuriman collaboration gacha. Second form, Dark Lord Zeus. He might actually be one of the rarest gacha units in the entire game due to his collab status and rarity. Stats are shown here. He's a very solid option at eliminating traitless enemies off the field due to his big damage nukes as well as his wide LD. His 455 range is enough to outrange the Sloth and Master A, and makes him an excellent answer to them. Kamel can be countered using his LD, and every other traitless enemy apart from Croakley can be dealt with if you use some setup. He does have a long force swing, but you can use support options to protect him or use stepping stone enemies to put him in a safer position. As a generalist, he's okay, with good range and good DPS for an LD unit, but long cooldown and 3 knockbacks tends to make him just supporting fire. His high HP is also nice to have. Generally, he'll do some damage to non-traitless, but you mostly want to use him to eliminate traitless enemies. As for particular enemies, He's great versus the aforementioned traitless backliners, and is still very good against frontline traitless enemies as well. If set up well, he can wreck Aros and remove them off the field very quickly. As for what beats him, Curse would take away his damage modifier, but there aren't actually too many stages in the game with both Curse and big traitless threats, so this is actually rare. 
normal LD attackers and status enemies can be annoying to him, as he has no immunities besides weaken. Knockback in particular can juggle him and prevent him from attacking due to his long force swing. Aggressive enemies can push into his blind spot and punish him, so make sure to support him properly. He'll do a great job on R.O.S. stages like Procrastinator Parade, Authority and Gravity, and Glass Slippers. For ones with Henry, like Caliban's Keeper and Clone Farmers, he can still work, but it requires more precision. R.O.S. does tend to be the most threatening traitless enemy that you would use him on, but he can also be used to snipe traitless backliners in stages like Surviving Herd, Pasta Desert, and Kuala Lumpur. Overall, a very solid anti-traitless backliner that can be used to remove traitless threats off the field very effectively. I'd say he's somewhat of an underrated unit, but that just might be due to his rarity of acquisition. And the final legend rare coming from either of the Street Fighter collab gotchas is Akuma. Second form, Akuma CC. I feel like a decent chunk of you guys would know who he is before you even heard of Battle Cats, but this was not the case for me. Stats are shown here. Similar to Black Zeus, he's designated as an anti-traitless specialist. He has an even higher DPS than Black Zeus, but has no LD and only 450 range. A high movement speed of 20 allows him to move across the field fast, but his very low 34,000 HP at level 30 makes him die pretty easily. Another problem Akuma has is how his damage is split into 3 multi-hits apart by 4 frames, which can cause him to miss his full damage output on enemies with high knockback counts like Rain D or Dolphina. Natural freeze immunity makes him pretty good on Henry Sages, and his fast attack cycle may allow him to juggle certain enemies. A lack of a blind spot also allows him to cover the shorter range enemies that would have entered Black Zeus's blind spot. As a generalist, his DPS and range are decent, but nothing special. His low HP may be a reason not to use him though, as he can die pretty fast. If you happen to need a generalist with high speed and the HP doesn't matter, then you could see some usage on the field though. He's great against the same traitless enemies as Black Zeus, excluding the Master A and Kamel due to lack of LD. Generally, he'd perform worse than Black Zeus against most of these, but he would still be more than enough to deal with even the strongest traitless enemies. He can be countered pretty easily by LD enemies due to his low HP, and the same applies with Surges. Stages with lots of aggressive enemies with high knockback counts could also end up seeing Akuma walk forward to his demise as well. Stages he'll do great on are mostly Arost ones like Procrastinator Parade, Caliban's Keeper, and Clone Farmers. He can be used to eliminate specific traitless threats in some stages, but he can't snipe backliners like Black Zeus can. He can also work well in Heavenly Tower Floor 41 and Infernal Tower Floor 31, as his high range, DPS, and lack of a blind spot makes him an excellent counter to the Manic Lions. Overall, a pretty mixed unit when it comes to his power. He can be very strong versus the right enemies and stages, but he can also be shut down pretty easily. Akuma can serve as your general purpose anti-traitless, but ends up not being too much more than that. And it looks like we're done looking into all legend rares in the game. While some are stronger than others, and some may suffer from some big weaknesses, I wouldn't call any Legend Rare in particular a bad unit. They each can at least perform some valuable roles, making them always a pretty nice pull. And really, who can be upset when you pull one of the rarest units in the game? It's always fun to flex that to your friends. Here's a small grouping of what I would consider to be their boosting priority, or just kind of their power level. At the high priority, we have Gaia, Lumina, Abyss, Benkei, Pandora, and Black Zeus. These are all really strong specialists that maintain value throughout all parts of the game. Gaia is technically a generalist, but her damage output is so crazy she's basically a specialist versus traded enemies. Do keep in mind though, that if you already have a unit that does the same role as one of the units and does that role pretty well, while also having your investment already in it, you might not need to boost the ones here. For example, 
If you already have a high leveled and talented Subterra Sentinels, you might not gain much value out of boosting Doom Engine Pandora. Next up we have the Decent Priority, which are options that can be pretty strong but depending on the situation, might not need the boost. These include Momoko, Nanaho, Jean, and Akuma. Momoko is already a great functioning unit at just level 30 with her crowd control, and can miss her nuker hit quite easily, so you may have better options to boost. A similar case applies to Nanaho, even at 30 is good enough for most metal stages and generally is not worth investing into early on compared to your other units. Jane can be strong against her target traits, but you tend to want to boost counters to these with generalist qualities instead, like Cameraman, Fishman, and Courier. Akuma is just alright, I guess. For our last tier, we have the questionable priority to boost, with the remaining units. Do note that I named this tier questionable, because it really depends on how your playthrough is going so far. Musashi can beat the Pure Land at just level 30 with combos, but if you don't have those combos, you can increase his level by just a little bit to compensate. Babel is mostly only worth boosting once you reach the end game, where you can finally encounter the stages where he can situationally be very strong on. Legaluga is a decent unit to boost sometimes for some rusher damage, can be nice to have if you haven't rolled gacha units like Fishman or Can Can yet. And oh yeah, I wouldn't recommend boosting Tyrant. You're much better off spending your investment in more reliable options that scale into late and endgame better than he does. Well, it looks like we're at the end. Thank you guys for watching, and tell me in the comments if you're fine with getting some guide-like content now and then, or just want me to do mostly entertainment-based commentary. If you're wondering why this video exists, well, I kind of just got bored one time and wanted to mess around with Legend Rares, and use this video as an excuse to do that. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next video, hopefully.